The Fretboard Journal podcast is brought to you by Mike and Mike's Guitar Bar, Peghead Nation, Isotope, Stringjoy Strings, and Stumac. Check the links below for some special offers and tell them the Fretboard Journal sent you. We also want to remind you to check out our print magazine, the Fretboard Journal. It's unlike any guitar magazine you've ever seen, and it's filled with things you can't find online, in-depth interviews, photo essays, histories, and contributions from creatives like Josh Scott. Crafted just for guitar fanatics, it proves that print isn't dead, it just needed a reboot. Subscribe at fretboardjournal.com. Josh Scott, thanks for being on the Fretboard Journal podcast. Finally, we got you. I'm here. I'm here. I don't even remember when you first asked or it when I asked. A while I ago. probably asked to be on it. I don't know. <laughs> it was a while ago. Uh, we have a whole bunch we could talk about. We haven't really prepared anything, which is kind of how I like to do these usually. I don't know how you work, but I saw I saw where you kind of went over, and I didn't read it. I was like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Like I purposely just went. Ah, we'll just see yeah. what happens. First no, off, I'm, I'm good. I'm good with by the seat of the pants. Okay. First off, thank you for being a part of the Fretboard Journal universe. You contributed to our 50th issue. You've been to the last two Fretboard summits we've had in Chicago. We're dragging you to the third one in August. Absolutely. I think you're helming our science fair. If well, I don't I know that you knew that, but you I, are. I did. I agreed to it. <laughs> okay. I'm excited. Uh, and so if anybody out there is listening to this and has some wacky invention that will probably never see the light of day, but is amazing and brilliant, email me to sum, uh, summit at fretboardjournal.com and let me know what you've created in your basement or your lair or your workshop or whatever. And we'll try to bring it to Chicago, have you do the, the dog and pony show, and it, it could be cool. And, and I'm Josh excited see to it. see to see the crazy. I love it. I love it. Just the stuff I saw last year was like this is amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's. I, I know we. I, I originally wanted to talk to you about media and specifically guitar media, just because it's something I think about twenty four seven. Being the publisher of this mm-hmm. quirky guitar magazine that I put out. Uh, but before we get to that, let's let's get a little rundown on JHS history because I have a feeling some fretboard journal readers still don't know your background and and what you've been up to over the last few decades. Yeah. Uh, when did you JHS to- <laughs> start and how did it start? Um, it's there's a date and the date <laughs> the date is. Um, it's spring of 2007. I fixed a broken pedal. Uh, just a guitar player, mm-hmm. and I fixed a pedal. And I'm a very obsessive personality. Um, being 42 now, I can look back over my life and go, oh, yeah, that's why I'm like really tunnel visioned. On like, I have these like eras of it's like the Taylor Swift eras, you know, like I only have an era. I don't, I don't parallel anything. So I remember like I grew up like around horses and we like broke horses and raised them and stuff. So that was like horses, like I'm going to live and die horses. And then it was like live and die basketball, live and die uh, band, you know. And then I hit this thing where I fixed this pedal. And that was like the ultimate, the switch flipped. And I just lost my entire mind over like how pedals work. So I fixed this pedal. And then uh, that the particular pedal was a Boss Blues Driver, the BD2. Great pedal. And I used to use two of those. I would like stack them. And one of mine was a Robert Keeley modified Blues Driver. So when I fixed the broken one, which was just the standard, I had opened it up. You know, I never to my knowledge, I don't think I'd ever just opened a pedal. Like I'd never had an issue with a pedal somehow. That's a miracle, I guess, up to that age. And I just was like, what are these thingies with colored stripes on the resistors? And what are, you know, I saw the parts and it was like a little city in there. And then when I fixed that foot switch that had broken, I said, I wonder what the other one looks like. Cause it has the Robert Keeley sticker on it and it sounds different. What did he do? And then the rabbit hole went really deep so i pulled out a notepad at some point in this venture a couple days in 
and I began to write down, I kind of sketched it and then kind of wrote down like this, this big clunky thing, which is a capacitor. I didn't know it looks different and it has a different number. What do these numbers mean? Let's go to radio shack. Let's uh, this is, this is like we had internet, but it wasn't awesome yet. You know, mm-hmm. this is 07. You could Google stuff. There was some pretty decent um, guitar uh, DIY forum. There was stuff. Mm-hmm. But like right now, you can Google, if you just go Google images, Tube Screamer schematic is like seven billion. Like there's tutorials and videos. Yeah. I just started diving in really hard to what, just teaching myself what stuff was, what was going on in a pedal. I got a couple of like, uh, presumably community college electronics textbooks, that kind of vibe, you know, like cheapo books. And I just started like, what's, what's current, you know, what is an ohm? What is, how does voltage work? What's a capacitor do? What's a amplifier? Yeah. And that was Oh seven in that period. So that's the start. I immediately started modifying pedals and then I started, um, selling them well a friend i was in jackson mississippi at the time and there's a really cool guitar shop if you're if you're anywhere near jackson fondren guitars tell patrick i said hello he's a great guy he started um he's like hey let me sell a few on consignment so i just you know i like made some i bought some avery printer labels at like walmart and like printed and i was like he wanted a few it's like what do i call these so i was like jhs because it's my initial you know i'd like had no idea what to call anything i take them in and they sell and then some bands like picked them up you know I believe it, like the black crows is a band called mute math who was really cool at that time and people just don't like carrie underwood's guitar player and so i i had this thing going where i was selling the modded pedals and then i started because I was so in the black hole. I, I, I educate through, I, I, I learn for, edu- for uh, let's, how do I word this? I like learning for entertainment. That would be the term. Mm-hmm. So it just gets me further in the hole. So I start etching boards and like making my own tube screamers and fuzz faces. Very classic boutique story. Like a million people have entered this way, but that was like what happened. And then I started modifying those. And then lo and behold, things like the pulp and pill compressor happened the morning glory, the, you know, just some of the pedals, you know, now they kind of happened. And I had a website on iWeb. You remember iWeb? Yeah. (laughs) Good times. (laughs) And I was like six months behind on orders. Yeah. Trying to do other stuff. My, you know, just like very busy, but, and the people kept buying and then someone said some business genius told me just raise your prices and you'll sell less and make more money. Mm-hmm. I raised my prices and sold more. So I'm like even further behind. And and that's where there's this moment in there in 2008. Uh, by 2009, early 2009, I just said, I'm going to do this. This is the stupidest like guitar pedal. Like I have no education in business. I'm self-taught. I'm the biggest imposter there will ever be in anything here. I'm just going to go for this. And I remember my wife, you know, we just have a newborn and she's, we're in the car one day and she looks over and she's like, do you really think she's worried out of her mind? And she's like, do you really think we can, you can make a living and like support our family? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. Uh, In my head, I was like, I have no idea, but I, I had to do it. I happened and I was like, I'm going to go for this. So that's the origin. Mm -hmm. Um, very typical origin story, but with some nuance that's, you know, just kind of my version of it, I guess. Yeah. That's how it started. But then obviously you ramped up in a huge way. I mean, because there are a lot of people who never get beyond that. I'm working by myself on my kitchen counter, making as many of these as I can a month. Yes. Um, Yes. <laughs> is there a question in there? <laughs> I guess the question is, uh, did you go down the black hole of learning uh, how to be a business person or, or was there someone who came along and was like, I'll be your middle manager that you need? Yeah. Okay. No, this is where, this is where, and I'm, 
honestly, I'm learning to just embrace this for what it is and just say what it is. And it's been hard for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I hate selling my own pedals. I don't like talking about, I don't like the car salesman thing. I've always sure. been very anti that. And, and, but there's a piece of this where I'm, I turn 42 and I'm like, you know, a little bit of therapy along the years. I'm just like, I should just own up to the fact that like, I, I really like telling a story. I really like creating a product and I really like selling it. I don't love building the pedals. Like I don't, I don't wake up to like make each pedal. It actually yeah. kind of drives me nuts. And early on, I didn't, that wasn't my goal. I, and, and when I contrast myself, you know, as much of this pedal history as I, I'm always involved in the YouTube show, you, you see me telling all these stories. I feel a massive contrast with a lot of the boutique. I wouldn't even call it, JHS has never, it has been boutique, not much. The early stuff I would say is boutique, but the contrast is I usually see people and I have high respect for this. So, you know, like a Paul Cochran or someone who's like, I'm going to build every Timmy. That's Mm -hmm. like really amazing. I am not that person. I used to shy away from sharing that because it felt like, I don't know. It it felt like a, like a, don't say that people won't like you, but then I'm like, well, that's fine. That's who I am. And I'm just going to, I love setting down and breadboarding coming up with an idea, the circuit, the name, the color, what the knobs say, the whole story of the thing. Like, what is the, what is this thing's story? Why is it interesting in the human experience? And then figuring out how to efficiently manufacture it with a team of people that I've employed. I really love employing people. So early on, I was like, who can I hire to do this? I, early on, I, I have no idea where this came from because my parents, there's no, there's no like business his, My parents are blue collar as it gets dropped out of high school early, large families, very poor. So I don't have the like, Hey dad, while we're here at dinner, can we talk about a uh, 401ks? Like that's not my family. I mean, yeah. my dad's, they're like factory workers and stuff, yeah. but something instinctually in me was like, I love teams. I love like, I love creative collaboration. I love collaboration in business, but I didn't really understand all that for the to like five six years ago i started looking back and being like i collaborated with robert keely here the boss thing the like it started to make sense like this is what i naturally do i naturally love getting people involved in ideas and making them happen in, in a way that's that i can't do on my own and and i've always and i've gotten better and better at this but even early on What's the thing I suck at and how quickly can I quit doing it? There's like, I've always thought like that. I, you do not want me paying JHS taxes. There will never, you will not see the company much longer. Like if I have to pay the taxes and if I have to do the, the payroll and like, it's going to burn to the ground. Sure. So I think the answer, you know, how did it, how did we get to whatever you see? Very fortunate. I think there's always the thing of like, timing the era of pedals I was in the way I managed to leverage some things that hadn't existed before, like, you know, having someone help with enclosures and printing all that was really new. The internet with parts resources was pretty new. I had some advantages that people 10 years earlier didn't have. And then I, I just built a team and I kept bringing in people and giving them autonomy in my company and saying like, Hey, I need you to own this thing and do it. Cause I suck at it. And then the result now is some of these people have been with me over 10 years and they like, they kind of run it with me. You know, it's like, there's a big autonomy there. So I think that's where the JHS story takes a wild turn from what I've seen. I've yeah. seen a lot of companies where it's like the one person has to do everything that's my worst nightmare. Like I would rather die, like just kill me and get, I don't want to do everything. Um, I love what I love to do and the other stuff I've tried to not do. And speaking of what you love to do, you talked about the history, you talked about the storytelling at what point, because I think a large pool of guitarists know you for your YouTube channel and have never bothered probably to buy JHS product. Yeah. 
because uh, I mean, Which we're talking really a huge number of people. When did that happen? And what was the original idea, if there was one? And then I guess eventually I want to hear how it looks today. <laughs> yeah. The how did that happen is a great story. And I credit it right to Nick. Like this story gets credited. Like if this is a book you open, it's like, thank Nick. Thank you, Nick Laux. <laughs> okay. And if you know the show, you know Nick. So Nick's been with me for 13 years. I had this period. We started to, there's two pieces here. We started to grow because the pedals were selling better and we were up to, I think we had around 18 employees, which for a pedal company in America, that's a lot. That's, that's a good. lot of people at the time. And I was starting to do things. I had some breakthroughs with engineering and pulling people in and trying to make unique things. So I did the color box, which was like really successful, really unique and really risky. That was a big moment for me. And then I jumped into this idea of could some, could, Hmm. Could we take every big muff that matters and like put a rotary on it and actually switch the real circuits like a railway, not digital, but like, could I build all of them into one? And we did the muffaletta. So when I did that and it worked, I, I found myself in this really peculiar position where I found obsession hit me again, just like I fixed the pedal and the origin story of 07. I found myself at this folding table in the back of the shop working on the muffaletta and I had bought all the big muffs and they're all sitting there and I'm like a being them in a notebook. And then I just was like, this is so crazy. And then I saw like, you know what? I've read for 10 years that the Rams head is this and it sounds different than the triangle. And I was like, that's all bull crap. I'm sitting here with the pedals. This is bull crap. And then I was like, Oh no. And I just got really into like, Oh, I'm going to make this product and show everyone that this can be done, which is really cool, but also like, don't believe everything you read on the internet, you know, quoted Abraham Lincoln, that whole thing. It was, yeah. I felt myself in a spot where I was like, I love teaching. I kind of started realizing I loved history in that way. And I love teaching. And so that was a moment where I started collecting everything. After I finished the muffaletta, I was like, I need every tube screamer. I need everything that's ever been. T I want every clon. I want to I want to touch them with my hands. Yeah. Take them apart. I want to collect the brands, find the inventor and talk to them. Tell the story, the real story, not the like gear page version. And that was like the beginning of me doing these public talks. So I did like this thing, you know, one version of this. Is uh, well, I started teaching a class at a university, but then I uh, I did this thing at a local record store where I brought all the gear in. I had like the real amps, the real pedals, the real tape machines, and I had a person from the record store come up with a turntable, and I'd be like, you know, play uh, song three on "Are You Experienced," and he would play the record. And I called it "Off the Record," which is a, mm -hmm. a clever little title. Yeah, I need to do this again. Um, but I would play the record and then I would have the gear. I would build the rig and with the real stuff and teach everyone in the room what was happening on the record. And that was like, that sealed the deal because Nick was there playing drums as I did this. That's before the show ever existed. That's the show. That's what happened. Okay. And Nick came to me. This is probably a year after that, though. We both knew something clicked at that off the record. Like it was like, huh. This is interesting. A pedal company teaching history with a bunch of vintage gear, but it's not about the pedal company, but like it's super cool and the community dug it. Like it was a very organic, cool experience. And then probably a year later, him and I went through years of this, him specifically, because if we back up from that off the record, let's say four years before that, Nick was a builder. I walked down. I knew he could edit. And I said, Nick, I want to pull you off the builder line. I'm going to quit doing any print ads whatsoever. We're not paying for any advertisement. You're just going to make videos all day, any videos you can make. And that was the great experiment that led to Nick and I trying to do demos for ourselves, but hating it, like tr trying to not be a car salesman. Yeah. And there's, if you go to our YouTube channel and click like list first, yeah. you'll see these like 
weird prototypian like it's Nick and I like hey everybody like like it, we had a puppet show we had we had all these weird ways of showing a pedal you'll see us like demoing a walrus pedal like this is unheard of and nobody watched this stuff yeah so about a year after off the record though Nick's just done he's like I hate this because one day I walked in my office with a Les Paul and I played Vitalogy on my iPhone. I didn't edit it or do anything. And it got like 20,000 views instantly. <laughs> sure. And he had worked like for a week on a video and no <laughs> one watched it. And he said, we're going to start a YouTube channel. And I was like, people, wa-, I literally said, people watch YouTube. Yeah. And so Nick just said, I'm, a, he said, what do you want to talk about? I was like, I'm like in the fuzz right now again. He goes, all right, just history of fuzz tell the story get all your crap you've collected tell the story and that's what happened that that is the full like we kind of just slid into it because we hated demoing and it came from this like public kind of like we were doing you know like local events just a weird culmination of stuff led to let's do a youtube channel and that's that's what happened i mean that's the short version there's so many details to it but that's that's it and how long ago was that first fuzz history video that you worked on uh i was literally about to pull it up because i'm like i honestly can't remember um i think we did i believe let's see here i can't sort it on my phone that way i i think it was 2017 or something 2018 okay so not really that long ago for how established you are now and how I think it quickly was it's grown. Yeah. Yeah. And then when it started, I had these rules because like I know this community so well. I was like, I had really strict rules on what we made. I said, I will not talk about my brand for two years. And they were like, what? I said, can't do it. I can't do it because the moment I do, it's going to turn into like, the thing I hate most, which is some brand like just just like secretly peddling their products. That wasn't my interest. I had no interest in talking about my pedals. And that's why you see for two years, it's this brand, this old brand, this story. I was really trying to say to the community, like, no, really, I, I just love the history. Yeah. And so we stuck to that really hard until the pandemic. We released like the Legends of Fuzz in the pandemic and stuff. Then we started, we finally started freely feeling okay about, yeah, we released a pedal, check it out. We're shameless plug is where, that's where all that come from. Mm -hmm. And, and broadly speaking, like how much of your life now is being on YouTube versus running a pedal company? I know it's intertwined. Yeah. Right now, right now is a funky little spot because we're rebuilt. We're kind of rebuilding what it looks like. I would say at the, at the prime, the prime of us doing, you know, YouTube slash pedal company at the prime of what that looked like in its fullest capacity. Um, it's, it's easily 25 hours YouTube for me. And then, Mm -hmm. I have a pretty strict 40 hour. I try really hard, like for family and stuff and my yeah. own brain and make sure I go take photos and wander around. I, I do like 40, 40 hour, 45 hour weeks. So it's, it, it's pretty wild. Um, I got to where I was batch playing around with like, if I'm going to breadboard, I'm going to do it for like a week, come up with a bunch of ideas and not touch it for a year. Like I got to where I was like being really systematic. If we're going to have meetings are on this day only and like, the rest of it's YouTube or whatever. Yeah. It's, it's pretty crazy. And now that I've started writing, writing projects I'm doing, that's just like a whole other piece of, I less and less am in the day to day of JHS, although I still run it and I have a core team of six. Um, There's uh, bell and Nick, a guy named Michael hope is HR. Steve is the general manager. And so I meet with them. We like, we're very involved. I know everything I'm inputting, but I don't walk around and like, Hey, do that better. Like, that's not my job anymore. It's like, (laughs) not that I ever did that, but yeah, it's more of, um, I have a great team and I lead that team and that team runs the company to be frank. And so Mm -hmm. I'm able to do these creative, like telling these stories and try to get some of this stuff done. Yeah. 
Well, this is a perfect segue because uh, I I was stewing on guitar media in 2024 and what that meant. And I immediately thought of you because A, oh, cool. you're a storyteller and a, and a historically minded person. You also, I think, interestingly have, you know, a lot of interests outside of guitar. You, you're into cycling and gravel bike riding and photography and, and probably absorbing that media as much as guitar yeah. media. So I guess the question of the day is, you know, what's your what's your take on guitar media at large in 2024, where it's going? I mean, where is YouTube going is maybe a great way to start off. Like, do you see the numbers just continue to rise? Is, there, is the algorithm playing havoc on what you used to do? Do you think about this stuff? Yeah. Yeah, this is a wonderful, big, layered question. <laughs> um, I said... I, you know, I, I said in my story, I walked down to Nick, this was like 2016. And I said, we're withdrawing our company. I'll say it like this. Very, mm -hmm. it, was, it was this heavy. I am withdrawing any money from JHS marketing towards anything other than your salary to make videos. That was 2016. Because, yep. and I'm not just tooting your horn. The only magazine that made any sense to me was the, was yours. Aww, I, because it, you. because it, felt it was it's real like it, i don't i don't it's hard to say it because there's things about other ones i love and i have friends that have worked out or what and i wrote a column for a guitar you know like mm -hmm. i get the value of it but it felt like there was this period where it just felt like hanging on the ledge of paper media for a lot of these sure. guitar magazines because and this is hot take city right here, but it's like, how many times do we need slash on the cover? Sure. Right. How many times do we transcribe crazy? Tra like it's just, there's something that was dead there and it's like not recognizing it's dead. And it started feeling re really strange for me to give a magazine $5,000 for like a whatever, you know, yeah. and then, and then be like, all right, where's the data supporting this? It's not there. And then sure. I would be like, and I understand that I'm I'm definitely not the test of all consumerism, but it's like, I don't look at these magazines. Like we're, they're in our bathroom at JHS. So I felt that a long time ago and I started, and since then, I think I was right. I think I was right because the magazine I was writing a column for closed down two years ago. I, I like I've seen more and more just kind of disappear. And then what's left is you have this uh, totally other change. So guitar is not in a vacuum. That's a big statement here because marketing is not in a vacuum. If you're going to market a guitar pedal or your custom built guitar, you have to think about how the world's receiving anything right now. You got to, and to some extent, be in a bubble and think that marketing your pedal is different than marketing deodorant or something. There is a reality to like, how are people finding things? Sure. Well, we've seen in the last the pandemic, big times really lock this in, but you no longer pay for a commercial you just pay some influencer in her apartment and like they show it to 40 billion people on TikTok, right? Like that's, yeah. that's weird. Like, right. It might, yeah. it's very weird. This is a brand new thing. And so guitar is always behind on this. Um, I don't know why it's that same thing where like, I remember my first trips to Nam. Nam was like, you know, it was like visiting the Holy Wall or something. You know, it's like finally get to go to Nam. And I remember being like, why is everyone wearing black leather? Like, where, what's, because it like, <laughs> it was so, it felt behind in so many ways. Sure. And sure. there's something about guitar where it's so tempting to start a company in the musical industry, guitar musical instrument industry, and like live in the era that you loved most and ignore what's actually happening. And sure. from a business perspective, what's happening, your question, it's like, I think we're more and more, I mean, it's sealed the deal now. You, you have to be on social media. YouTube looks like it's still gonna, it's still growing. I don't understand, like, that's a crazy dynamic. Um, 
YouTube seems super healthy to me. I mean, mm-hmm. some people might argue the dangers of putting all your eggs in that basket if they decide to just not exist. I don't know. That, that's a problem. But I don't know what else to do there. I mean, the proof is in the numbers. I mean, millions and millions of views for just a little guitar pedal company in Kansas City is pretty crazy. I could never, our, you know, a low performing video for us is like a 30,000 view live or something. But I go, that's like I filled Chief Stadium or something to talk about a stupid overdrive pedal. This is insane. Like, yeah. we've never lived in an age where that was free. That was realistically free. You know, I had to pay for gear, but that's an interesting thing. I don't see that changing. I see it only getting weirder. Like, is some of this, like, virtual stuff going to come into play with it? I don't know, but I would just say, like, and you could answer this, like, how does print feel? I mean, I think you have a really special place in it, but it's got to feel crazy and dangerous and, like, Yeah. I mean, everything you said rings true for me on the print side. The funny thing is uh, your, your critique of mainstream guitar magazines was what inspired me in 2005 to start the fretboard journal was this realization of like, why would I, you know, I I forget what Google wasn't around. It was like Alta Vista or whatever, but you could still find tab online, you know, and it was like ASCII two or whatever, but you could find tab online and I, I just remember going like, why would, why would a magazine be filled with tab and and gear reviews? Like when there's all these forums, you know, there's all these chat rooms you could join, uh, where you'd get real world, you know, users. And so, you know, and and also I was deeply inspired by a lot of non guitar magazines that mm-hmm. that were, you know, the Surfers Journal out of California was the biggest influence and. You know, I was like, how do they make it as a surf? They're celebrating surf culture and surf history. They're way more guitarists. There are guitarists in the middle of the country, not just on the edges where the surf breaks are, you know? And that yeah. was kind of the original, the original impetus. But I mean, you're in a rarefied place when it comes to YouTube because you have this stable, big, growing company versus like a creator who's just like, I'm going to make a YouTube channel from scratch. Do you pay any attention at all to the metrics, the analytics, the how long did people listen or watch for? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've had to, I've had to, you know, I said earlier, like I learned for entertainment. So I've definitely had my moments of like, I'm going to explore what all this crap in the, in the (laughs) analytic button is. Um, I, yeah, I, I think, yeah. And I realized my spot is odd, you know, we monetize and you could say that's a good check that comes in every week from Mm -hmm. AdSense. I put it all back. I mean, I make, I make negative money. If you're looking at this, if I, if YouTube is my business, I'm screwed. Put it that way. Like, because I have a staff of four to six people, depending on the weather doing all of this. So all of that pours back into someone's salary. Yeah. The interesting thing though, is because I have the company, I'm aware of some things. I have been able to do whatever I want and be pretty reckless with worrying (laughs) about that algorithm Yeah, because the company pays the bills and the YouTube thing is more of the creative outlet. It's like my passion. It also sells pedals. I mean, I'm, I've, it's a weird thing where like YouTube's paying me to do a channel that ultimately market. Like, I feel like I, instead of paying guitar world five grand, YouTube's paying me to promote myself, but Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to promote myself or you would feel it. I I feel like our channel would suck so bad if I was like a car salesman, Sure, but I'm just like, we're on the internet is what I'm saying. We are existing. So it's kind of, you know, whether I talk about a pedal or not, I'm not, I'm not dumb. I'm aware people are going like, who's this tall, weird guy tall? Oh, he owns a, oh, okay. Click the site. You know, I get it. I get that. It's not the intention, but I, I, I do pay attention to that stuff, but my position is odd because YouTube is not where I make my money at all. I don't make money on YouTube, even though I get a check or what a a check shows my age, even though I get a bank wire, whatever it's called. Um, 
Yeah, I just turned that back around into the salaries for the show for people to edit and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned, you know, we talked about uh, guitar media. Uh, we talked about YouTube. Social media, like, are you guys mm -hmm. bothering with Facebook at all in these days? <sighs> Facebook do you know? So face, yeah, I do. I do. I do. The thing with Facebook is I keep trying to ignore it, but it's so powerful. It's like Facebook has these groups. Yeah. And the groups are like, I know this because I'm in like every Leica group and I'm like in, you know, I'm in the camera groups. Sure. So I'm like, Oh, I need a, I need to have my lens CLA or whatever. Like who do I go to? You get in a group and like 50 people answer you instantly. And there's all these guitar pedal groups and it's an insane place. It's like, it's like a professional yard sale 24 hours a day for anything you're interested in. I don't love Facebook, especially during an election year when I have like, you know, half my friends this, half this, and I want to go jump off a mountain. Sure. But the group thing, I think Facebook is highly underrated because the problem is it's because like my mom is on it. I'm not interested. But I think Facebook may be one of the most important ones right now, in my opinion. But I mean, because of the 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 group and because of the like closed wall thing it's not great for telling the world about a new jhs pedal right well it is because, okay because because if i put anything i put on facebook the community who loves hs which has gotten big yeah they go share it everywhere it's facebook this is crazy that this is coming out of my mouth, but I, I'm at a place. And I, I think a couple other people are starting to say this because I felt nutty saying this. I think Facebook is possibly the only remaining truly viral community because they will take the ad. Ad is loose for it could be a picture of a pedal or a video clip, and they'll go share it without – asking me at all all over the groups and so it's like truly viral viral meaning infecting the next thing touching the just like you give someone a cold these communities are like they're like 1000 miles an hour just crunk about anything they want to argue or love something all the time sure and so and it's real and organic it's weird. It's like Facebook is this strange thing that I wish I could look away from, but it has the more honest share thing going on in it. Whereas Instagram and stuff, I have no idea what they're, I can't figure it out. Like I can't figure out is Instagram. What's it? Why am I seeing cat videos? I looked at one video. Why am I yeah. inundated with cats? Facebook doesn't seem to be doing that. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, you know, all this stuff is subject to change because they'll change sure. the algorithm next week. But like, I'm being inundated with, you know, groups, including a lot that I don't even have any, I don't know what they were thinking as to why I would want to join some of these yeah. groups, like regional, like far, far away regions from where I'm sitting. Uh, You're getting like bird watching in Minnesota or something. Yeah, yeah and I don't yeah. even know, like, what, <clears throat> did I look at a bird the wrong way? Like, why, what, what happened there? Uh, but I know what you mean. Like we have a, a, a group for our Truth About Vintage Amps podcast and it's already splintered into like now there's a Canadian faction and then there's like an Australian and New Zealand. Yeah. Like it's yeah. just exploded into this weird thing where I'm like, this is amazing. And I, I had nothing to do with it. It just happened. It, and like, so outside of the U YouTube and JHS, I'm also in the pedal collecting community, that's a tight knit group. And there's, you know, I have four good friends who are equally psychotic as me and we're helping each other sort stuff all over the world. Those groups are like priceless. And it's, it's the feeling of you have like your little real community and it really matters that you chose to enter that community. So if you go to the Leica M group, you love Leica M's and you're going to talk about the texture of the grip and the, you know, 
if you love JHS, you're going to be in that stupid little JHS group and you're going to be like talking about whose initials were in a pedal in 08. And like, that's weird. I don't see that anywhere else. So if you, anywhere you see authentic conversation on a subject, that's the place to put your information. And so for me, I can't, I can't force that anywhere else. Like Facebook is just naturally interested in JHS. And I find that very, I don't know what to do with it, you know, because my mom's in there reposting memes and stuff. I, I don't know. It's confusing. I, I'm surprised. I mean, I, I guess, you know, Facebook is easy to trash and it's easy to just be like, oh, that ship sailed. So I, I'm, I'm surprised, but I guess I shouldn't be. And you'll have a guy like, you know, take it or leave it, like Gary V. He's halfway interesting half the time. Sure. He's like Facebook stories or, or shorts, whatever they're called. He's like, that's the most, that's the hottest thing in the world right now. And I think he's right. It's like, and then you start, the new thing is LinkedIn. Like LinkedIn yeah. is suddenly massive. And what is, it's because young professionals are like dating on it. Yeah. So you end up like there's pedal ads on LinkedIn. What is happening? I don't know. Do you guys do any is, of that? <laughs> no, but I've seen them. I've seen people like there's crazy stuff with LinkedIn right now. I I thought LinkedIn died like 11, 12 years ago. Yeah. And I'm recently finding out like this is the place to be. Yeah. LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. Are you guys how much energy do you guys put towards TikTok? Um, the same, we kind of, we try to make unique cuts of content for each one, but we just kind of, you know, every other day, make sure we post on everything and it's mm. so hard. It's mm. hard. Yeah. Like for us, you know, if we're making a YouTube video, we write and produce that video in the context of make sure these parts are in there to be cut out as things for short form. It's so much and it feels like, you know, I'm literally like, do I need to be thinking about LinkedIn when I like, like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know it. And so I think there's a full circle thing here. I find myself now more than ever having to not worry and just make stuff I want to make. And then like, I guess this is, I just need to. My number one concern lately is like that I'm having fun and not getting burnt out and that I smile when I see something I made. And if that's all I can do, then at least I'll be able to do it longer. If mm -hmm. I keep worrying about TikTok this and that, I'm going to I'm going to make stuff I don't like. That's my biggest fear. Yeah. One of my biggest fears is like if I ride and I love the I love the game a little. But if I ride that game, I'm going to quit. I'm going to like retire in five years or so. I'm going to be like, I hate this. Totally. Because if I can just make stuff I enjoy, then I'll do this longer. It might not be exactly what people want, but I'll be around longer. That makes sense. I'm telling myself that's my self therapy. <laughs> we, we all, every business owner tells themselves something like that, I think. Yeah. That's my, that's my, right now, that's my whole, that's my zen. Since you brought up the Leica thing, like, are there forms of media in the world of Leica? Uh, a rarefied world, but a huge world uh, with a very passionate base. Are there blogs, podcasts, things that exist for that world where you're like, why doesn't this exist for guitar? Um, I, I think the parallels pretty darn spot on as it is. I, I feel like the Leica groups and the Leica fandom, I I feel like they're almost mirrors. I don't I don't necessarily know of anything missing from our world with it. Um, but I'm sure there are. And I, I loved what you said earlier. Just another big shout to to Fretboard. You said I didn't take my inspiration from other guitar magazines. So yeah. that's like my biggest, like, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Cause <laughs> with any creative work, the best works are, it's the whole vacuum thing. Like you can't go make a better guitar pedal only looking at guitar pedals. Yeah. You can't make a better amp only looking at guitar amps. And so I love that you have executed that and like proven it because, and that's the question is like, is there stuff 
that Leica's doing, or like something like that. I mean, they've I got the stores, which I don't know what the guitar equivalent would be. If I mean, I guess Gibson's got their showrooms the stores, or whatever. The the problem with Leica, <laughs> it, it, I love the stores because they're so pretentious. They're like, they're like, so I have to be careful what I say here. I love, the Klon, I love the Klon I love the Centaur. I genuinely love the pedal. I love the way it looks. I think it's brilliant. I think Bill's eye for I think I think it's a masterpiece of a product. Is it worth what people are paying? Absolutely not. Is it clonable? Yes. Get all that out of the way. But I love that pedal. I have deep respect for him and that pedal and what he did in the industry. Do I agree with choices and no, I don't, but I love that pedal. I think that Leica has this thing that kind of parallels with like if the Klon Centaur as a business was was done more in a way that was like holistic. Like like imagine like a Klon store in Soho. Like that feels <laughs> that works, right? I mean, yeah. you would you know what I'm saying? It kind of feels like way more people take photos than play Klons. Sure. But there's something about the Klon uh there's something about the Leica the culture and community or like the whole, whatever it's called. There's some parallels. Like the thing is that Leica feels, it can feel really exclusive and expensive and like special, but I don't feel the hype thing. You'll, you'll hear people say that camera's hype, but then you'll use one and get used to it. And you're like, crap, you're like, I need to get one. <laughs> the Klon thing ha- there's some parallels there. I don't even know what I'm unpacking. There's something yeah. about um, could some, I guess the question I would ask is like, could someone do like what a Dumble did or a Klon or like you could probably name some guitar builders I'm unaware of that are like, they feel untouchable or something. It's like, sure. could someone do that in a way that's actually more customer centric and more aware of the realities of the market? Like, uh, getting it to more people, being more friendly, being like more, you know what I mean? Like, is there yeah. a way to do something high, high end with such prestige, but kind of like just do it really well, like from the customer side? I yeah. don't know. I guess that would be the, that exists in cameras. That exists in almost every, guitar has some weird spots where it feels like, if you want the prestigious thing, you're screwed. I don't like that. Like, well, guitar shoots itself in the foot because you know, in the world of of watches and in the world of cameras, that's another good one. Watches, is like a good one. like that audience accepts that a Rolex costs seven thousand dollars or whatever, or that a Leica costs seven thousand yeah. or whatever. Sure. Whereas the knee jerk, the minute a guitar is announced, is like it costs what? <laughs> and then reminiscing about how much a guitar costs when the poster was in high school or whatever. Yeah. This Whereas, is, yes. Yeah. There's an acceptance of just like, yeah, this is the admission price. It's a Leica. And you know what? You can sell it a year from now for basically what you bought it for because it doesn't tank in value. Every single Leica that I have, <laughs> I have all the, I've traded and bartered over year. They're all worth more than what I gave for them. How is that not a good move? Like you yeah. can't say that with like Bitcoin and stuff all you can't be sure. But like sure. this is the M5 setting here. <laughs> like this <laughs> good prop. <laughs> I just had it with me. I mean, this camera is worth more than it was worth. Yeah. I don't know what to do with that. It's not that expensive, but it's like guitar the the guitar world. It drives me nuts. I don't even know what drives me nuts. It's just everything you're saying. It's like this price of this guitar, let's hate on it. But then like, what's the alternative? Like, I don't understand what people want. You can't have like super amazing lifelong quality products for like the, for like the, you know, 199 bucks. Like it's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, guitar is complicated. It is complicated. It feel, out of, and I think about this stuff all the time because I love other industries. But guitar, there's something about like, well, back when I was a kid, it's like all I ever hear. And I don't know why that is with guitar. Yeah. 
Yeah, you don't see on the watch side like people logging on to Houdinki to be like, you could buy a Timex or or an <laughs> Apple Watch or whatever. Like no. you just don't see that. You see enthusiasts embracing the product or ignoring it, and there's not that defensiveness. Yeah, you would never go to a Leica M group and say, <laughs> you could just buy the Sony RX100 down there at Costco. It's like, no, you don't. Why are you here? <laughs> Yeah. Like you don't have to like, like like, that's the thing with guitar is like, I genuinely don't care if you like JHS. I I will at some point if all of you hate it, Mm -hmm. but like I'm fine with someone saying run of the mill JHS stuff. Like they all look silly. The colors are too bright. Like whatever. That's fine. Like that's totally fine. You, but I feel like you just don't see that with other products, you know? All my guitar maker friends and amp makers, the same stuff. It's like, it's just really bizarre. It's a bizarre universe. Yeah. We, uh, we've we talked about social media. We've talked about <clears throat> magazines a little bit. Uh, where are you at with your writing and, and where are you going to put that? Uh, obviously, open invite in the fretboard journal, if anything, fits our roster. Yeah, I... So... When I started, I, uh, right when the YouTube thing happened, I had already started um, carrying around a voice recorder and just gathering people's stories at NAMS and stuff. I had this, I had the moment where I was like, I know some of these people. They're not going to be here forever. I'd love to hear the story, you know. Some of that started with like getting to collab with Boss. It's like I find myself in Japan. It's like this is cool. Like I need to record this stuff, almost like a a diary of sorts. And then asking friends their stories. And then when the YouTube channel started happening, I found myself on the phone with Pete. I'd be like collecting a brand and be like, "Well, hey, here's the story of this brand you've seen for forty years." But I here's the owner, and I talked to him, and here's how it happened. Well, then I started filming people in interview style, documentary style. Um, and not really knowing what to do with it. I do think there will be some like pretty hefty documentary type things. I'm excited about that. That's but cool. the obvious thing was I'm really doing this to capture the stories because I want to write about it. And so that journey has been really interesting in parallel with running a company and the YouTube channel and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, where I'm at with it is I have finished one book completely. I am halfway through another large project. And then I have the book I'm most excited about. I've written the first draft three times. Is that a third draft? I think that's I, a third draft. Yep. It's a hard book. It's it's the story of technology's influence on guitar from 62 to 69. And it's wow. just the reason... the The reasons of this book, it's a book about creativity, but it uses guitar as the characters and inventors. And so what am I going to do with them? I I think they're all, I think I'm just going to start a publishing company. And because everyone I talk to, I've made good friends with a lot of authors who are successful and people in publishing. And they're all like, I swear to God, if you don't just do it because of the YouTube channel and stuff, they're like, why would you ever like, <clears throat> why would you ever publish with a publisher? There's probably some reasons, but yeah, I think the ticket for me is like, it kind of falls into that. I want to, I need to do what makes me happy. So I'll do it longer. I think there will be a point. It'll probably be when you see a first book come out, they'll just keep coming out. That's probably what will happen. But right now I'm like, eh, like all of it's a little on edge. I'm not sure where to place it. <clears throat> and I need to finish up a couple things on, on one or two of the projects. So yeah, like I'm really passionate about writing. I bit off wit classic Josh, a bit off way more than I could chew on some of this because I love learning. And it's like, I had to basically hit a point. I had a, I made friends with this guy, a very successful nonfiction author. He's a research guy too. And he's like, you've got to quit studying this crap. You'll never write your, and I, cause I'll just keep, and he's the same way. So he gave me some advice and I was like, oh, okay, I'm killing my, I'm killing my own project. Cause I just keep researching it. Like, cause it's fun, right? It's yeah. fun. So I'm coming out of some of that. I think there'll be JHS publishing. 
I think that that will also involve other people's books that are friends of mine cool. in the space. I think I'll probably do some Japanese to English translations of very important books I've discovered there about their guitar technology and stuff. I don't know. I love fretboard. Let's do it all. Let's do it together. I don't know. You know, I want to do some stuff in fretboard. That's been the... I remember telling you a year ago, like, yeah, let me do that. And then it's just so hard to dig into what is You've that. been busy, as, as the last hour yeah. can attest to. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it's pretty cool. I mean, it bodes well for, for those of us who are trying to make basically, you know, a quarterly coffee table book that you, the, the guy who famously said, no more print ads, is doubling down and investing in paper. <laughs> so, yes, I, I love that you said this. I think I think that books are the are just so I think they're so culturally and massively important and I think they're timeless. Yeah. Books are such a to me the a book is the is the ultimate and it, I think it always will be. They just want a book will not go away for some reason. And everyone's seen this. I remember Kindles coming out and it's like, "Oh no." Yeah. It's the same thing like you know, Kemper comes out and people act like we were going to throw their Princetons in the dumpster. I'm like, no, they're not. Like, it's not how it works. Books are just really important. I think they're these time stamps of like good publishing and authorship is like such a timeless, important thing for people like in your position or whoever. Like, if you're in this world, we should be making more books. I think the lack of books in our world of guitar is a little disturbing. When you yeah. look at other there's an importance that I think there's some people that like, if even if it's an encouragement, if you're listening to this, go make your books, like do them. They don't have to be perfect, but start making books. If, if you feel that thing, I think it's, we're going to lose these stories. That's like one of my yeah. biggest, I just hate that idea. I would rather put a book out. That's at least out than lose some of the stories for sure. I agree a hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, you have probably a younger skewing audience than mine. Are you going to put out a Kindle or digital version? I'm sure you've thought of this. Or are these books going to be paper? And that's it. They're definitely paper. I'll do Audible. And I don't know after that. I, I To me, it's like, I'll probably do paper. I'll probably do a Japanese translation on a few of them. And then I'll do an audio book. I don't. I haven't thought about Kindle and stuff. I don't see why not. I think a lot of people do the Kindle, the mm -hmm. Kindle thing. I'm a paper book person. I yeah. can't, I can't actually, I, when I listen to audiobooks, I, I can't remember. I don't retain anything. So actually I'm the, I'm the nerd that like reads a book. I highlight and then I put the book on the shelf. I'll go. And then I have this method where I go back like a month to six months later. And then I write notes down out of it. So I'll remember stuff and, Paper to me is like paper is the way for me, but I do have a lot of friends that do Kindle and such. Um, I don't know. What are you doing? Are you doing any Kindle stuff? We put out the magazine as a PDF for mainly the global audience who yeah. don't, you know, it's a hundred dollars basically to get this thing shipped to Europe. And it's like, I, I'd yeah. rather the stories and the information got to people who Does wanted it. Does that do it. well? Uh, what's funny is a lot of those people start out digital and go print and it's like the backwards world. It's like they listen to the album on Spotify and then buy the, the fancy vinyl version. That says a lot about what you're making though. <laughs> I mean, it, it really does. It's like, and I think even holding, when you hold a fretboard journal, it like you've managed to, it doesn't feel like a magazine. I always struggle with like calling it a magazine. It doesn't feel a magazine feels disposable like a fretboard journal doesn't feel that way it's just what you've made is kind of thank this, you yeah it feels different i don't even know why what it is about it necessarily other than i guess it's just yeah. the quality of it yeah <clears throat> uh switching gears i want to be uh, uh protective of your time like this is probably going to come out after this event but you guys are sponsoring like a gravel bike <laughs> right event. <laughs> and knowing that JHS has been, you know, ahead of the curve of like, we're going to go direct to consumers. We're going to not spend money on NAM. Like, 
does this make yeah. any sense at all? Or is this just, I love this world and I want to be a part of it on your part? Yeah. The, the specific uh, category of cycling <laughs> that you would call <laughs> gravel or adventure cycling has been a massive part of my life personally. Like yeah. my everything from my mental health to like, just like discuss, just like learn, just such a huge piece of my life. I mean, I even started the rabbit trail of like photography because of bikes. Yeah. Um. So number one, I love the the Midwest community of gravel adventure cycling. It's just such a huge piece of who I am. And then the connect is um, the mid south is in Stillwater, Oklahoma, and there's a guy named Bobby there. He is like, he's like if you could take a cartoon character and pump it full of cocaine and let it loose during like a bite. He's like he's an untamable force. Yeah, and he's amazing. He's such a loving, amazing, crazy. He's a guitar player, has a band. Like he was in a punk band, and it's like. The Mid South is this event that gravel cycling has become like a major sport now. Like it kind of started. I mean, you're up there in the yeah. you know the Renhurst land. Yeah. Um, gravel cycling has, in some sense, we could say it has sold out, which I think is whatever. But there's a thing where now it's more like, well, the pros are doing this one, and this is now part of this association, and blah blah blah. The Mid South is this. It's like he refuses to change it and it is this massive party. It's like a it's like a four day community in the middle of Oklahoma where it might rain on the red mud and it's mm-hmm. psychotic and there's a music festival at the same time. And it's like it's like guitars and bicycles and photographers and like it's like Disney. It's like a weird Midwestern creative Disney. And I just I love the event. I think it's I think it's one of the most um, uniquely American things you could ever experience as a community, you know. And you have you have pro riders that come, but they come because it's so anti pro. Sure. And then you'll have like the guy that's just like I'm gonna ride my bike 100 miles. It's gonna take me 12 hours, and they'll do it. And they'll come in at midnight or something. But yeah, we I've been a part of this. Uh, this event for like four years, I was photographing it. I started photographing the cycling community in the Midwest, like four years ago for like a potential book project. Cause I need more to do, but <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've um, like field essayed this thing to death. I've been to this event several times and I as just a com- never as a competitor it. though, just no, as a no. document. Yeah. Okay. As a, I care, I go and I shoot gravel races on film, which is really funny and hard. Like I'm what, and I purposely shoot a lot of this, this race. I have, I am psychotic and I chose, I'll take a, like a 35 millimeter rangefinder, but I will shoot a lot of the photography on a Hasselblad, which is so insane. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> but um, I get picked on. I'll be like, I mean, you have to imagine pro riders going by 35 miles mm-hmm. an hour. There's dust everywhere, and I'm like shooting a Hasselblad on. Do the you side put the black it. cape over your head like the old timey photo no, booth I, too? I, or I no, just, I just go for it, man. <laughs> Zone focus, bro. Um, I yeah, that's and we just more and more get integrated. So last year, if you've seen JHS universe you see bell who is nick's sister bell has an amazing band bell and the vertigo waves you can check them out on spotify and itunes and such is it itunes or apple music now that's an age thing uh Uh, but she played it last year with her bands amazing nick's nick's doing a set i'm actually playing a live set at this festival okay (laughs) this year 3 30 p.m on saturday me, Nick on drums, Rhett Scholl on bass, we're not going to rehearse. <laughs> and we're just, we we posted a video from the bike shop. I don't know if you saw that. No, I haven't you seen see that the, yet. So there's one of, we just, <laughs> it's what we do on the show. We, we make everything up on the spot. So I'm going to do a one hour set as a trio live on this. It's going to be ridiculous. So that's, that's some more information. 
I mean, this is why we all love you because you care passionately about what you care about, but then on another level, you're like, I don't care what anyone thinks. I'm just going to do this. I mean, it's, yeah, it's why you did the ice capades of pedals and all that other good stuff. I really, and I encourage everyone, you have to do stuff you want to do or you'll quit doing everything. I, I think yeah. there's like a, a piece of, as the creative brain, you need to do stuff that just, you don't have to explain it. And yeah. and you'll just stumble into weird crap that ends up becoming like your whole job somehow. Like that's, I just encourage people like, try it. Just try, just try stuff and don't worry if the algorithm likes you and don't worry if, if your friend thinks you're crazy. That's yeah. like, I'm more and more embracing it. Yeah. Uh, just to end this conversation on a on the creative note, are there any books on writing or creativity or anything that have really inspired you lately? Um, yeah, there's there's some good stuff out there, really impactful. Um, one of the most helpful books as a creative I have read in years is a book called Deep Work. Um, that book was like a huge wake up call to me like hey you you're doing your work you need to think differently about how you're on your projects mm -hmm. so yeah the author the guy's last name is Newport Cal Newport in deep work it's just about setting uninterrupted time aside and what it actually does to your work that was huge for me as far as writing and stuff i've just um not really. I've been, I read a lot, but I think, um, I've no, not really. I, I think I've just been gleaming a little bit from, from everything, but yeah, I can't recommend that deep work book enough. I think in a world where your cell phone dings like every eight seconds, like this is, we're losing the ability to focus for a period of time. Yeah. And I think that music and writing and art in general is going to suffer if, if we don't, like as a culture start recognizing like we actually need to have undistracted moments of creativity. So that's like where I've been trying to live a little more. I love it. Yeah. Josh, uh, if I guess I probably won't see you till August in Chicago, but uh, I can't Science thank you thing. enough. We finally did it. We did it. I loved it. Love what you're doing, man. I, I like everything you do. You could say, Hey, I'm doing a rodeo and I'd be like, where's it at? 